Moses like, told his disciples a parable about the need to pray continually and never lose heart. There was a judge in a certain town, he said, with neither fear of God nor respect for men. At the same time, there was a widow who kept on coming to him and saying, I want justice from you against my enemy. For a long time he refused, but at last he said to himself, maybe I have no fear of God nor respect for men. But since she keeps pestering me, I must give the widow her just rights, or she will persist in coming and worry me to death. The Lord said, you notice what the unjust judge has to say. And will not God see justice done to his chosen who quiet him day and night, even when he delays to help them? I promise you, he will see justice done to them and done speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find any faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, and Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. 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 So I do welcome you on this day. It's one of my favourite days in the year. You're most welcome. It's a great privilege for us to have David Mary team and you here, no, coming from near and far. So you're all very welcome, those who are, uh, who are now watching us in, on the internet and live streaming. We do commend you for joining us in that way as well today. Mm. Have you been to a cemetery recently? Have you been there yesterday, or the day before yesterday, or indeed both those days, or the day before yesterday? Why am I asking you? Because if you haven't, then you haven't taken the opportunity the church gives you to gain a plenary indulgence for holy souls, which you are able to do all of this month. Plenary indulgence is one of the greatest things that we can do for the holy souls. And in November, we have a great opportunity to do so. And you who are devout Catholics in front of me, if you haven't been doing those things, then you need to do so because, precisely because, other people will not be doing it. It used to be the case, it would be just the first week in November, from the 1st to the 8th of November, that one could, apart from the Feast of All Saints and All Souls, where just going to Mass fulfilled the criteria, that you had to go to a grave and pray there, and then you would gain a plenary indulgence with the other conditions that we know of, okay? So Holy Communion, Confession a week either side, praying for the Pope and saying the Creed. And we have to be aware that these holy souls need our prayers. They are in purgatory. And we know that other denominations, they have a great belief in Jesus. But they don't believe in praying for the dead. They believe there's either two places that they can go to once they die, heaven or hell. If you're in hell, you can't do anything for them. And if you're in heaven, they don't need our prayers. So this is a key Catholic doctrine. We have to think about Henry VIII when the country became Protestant, that before then there are masses continuously for the holy souls. You can imagine a production line of things, let's think about cars maybe, whole thing all going very smoothly, and then suddenly things suddenly get very slow. And cars come out very slowly. Imagine you're a holy soul, you see this production line kind of think, oh, this is very quick, I'll be out of purgatory very, very quickly. And suddenly we have what's called the Reformation, and suddenly our country, because Henry VIII changed the religion, becomes Protestant, and suddenly that production line is slowing, and you as a holy soul have to suffer much more time being in that state before getting to heaven. Would have been a disaster for them. But we have this amazing power to help souls. It's an amazing thing that we can intercede from. They cannot, as we know, do anything for themselves. But with our prayers, especially the Mass, we can actually help them. And these plenary indulgences as well, we can gain this month. In October, for example, of course, it was the Rosary. He said the Rosary every day, maybe as a group or in home. Then again, you could gain a plenary indulgence. These things hopefully don't seem medieval to you. Hopefully you're not thinking, gosh, that's a blast from the past, these plenary indulgences. I don't remember hearing them much being mentioned in the past. That is crazy. That is absolutely crazy. It's one of the most marvellous jewels of the church, the most marvellous privileges that we have to actually be able to help these souls in purgatory. 
We know, of course, the offering of masses, which we do, hopefully, and all those things are very good and obviously really important. But these plenary indulgences do urge you to gain as many as you can this month, so make a resolution. I'm sure you can find cemeteries that are open or cemeteries you can just go into without them being locked up and things like that. Try and do it every day up to November. We've got how many days left? I don't know, 15, 16 days. It'd be marvellous if you were to do that. Remember the other conditions, you have to receive communion on the day, confession a week either side, pray for the Pope's intentions, and also say the creed. If you do those things, you're helping your soul getting to, to heaven. And we're called to be aware that we have scriptural basis for that, from the letter of St. Peter and St. Paul, they do speak about purifying by fire. But maybe the most effective for us is the apparitions that we have of great saints having vision of the souls in purgatory. Two I'll choose, Padre Pio, of which we have a statue there of course. Padre Pio of course had many gifts, bilocation, stigmata. The other one was souls appearing to him and saying, please offer up a mass for me and I will then be able to be in heaven. And he would offer up mass and the souls would appear to him on the same day in grateful thanks for him for his prayers as they now were in heaven. We can think also of Saint Faustina, I'm sure many of you I'm sure know the divine mercy devotion and Saint Faustina being a very generous soul asked our Lord is there anything more I can do? We would have thought she was doing enough. And then our Lord gave, him, gave her a vision of purgatory. All these souls. So she asked her what is your greatest suffering? said the greatest suffering was being distanced from God. One of the most moving things about her apparition, especially on a day with Mary, is that she saw Our Lady in purgatory giving consolation to them. Isn't that marvellous thing of Our Lady giving consolation to those souls in purgatory? And they know her apparently as the star of the sea. It's marvellous to know, have privileged information about what name the holy souls give to Our Lady. Saint John Henry Newman, great English convert who became canonized and so on, one day he said the greatest evidence for purgatory was that from the very earliest times in the church they were praying for holy souls. The Reformation, 1600 years later, 1500 years later, was a complete discontinuity. Before then all Christians prayed for the holy souls. Suddenly we have this break and suddenly people deciding, no, 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 after the church has got it wrong for 1,500 years. They say, the church has got it wrong, mustn't pray for holy souls, there's no such thing as purgatory. What a crazy thing that is. People suddenly think that for 1,500 years, Christ didn't guide the church in these teachings, and suddenly they know better that no, don't pray for the holy souls, and also don't believe in holy communion as well. On that point, a slight cult, a slight it's like cul-de-sac. I asked this question many times to my confirmation canons, indeed First Communion uh, parents, say, in the first 1500 years, was there ever really a debate? Or what was the percentage of people who believed that the thing that we're going to receive a few moments of time, Holy Communion, actually, how many people believed that? Because we know now there's a complete difference of opinion, go to the Methodist, Baptist, Maybe the other churches, so on, they don't really believe it's Jesus, they believe it's just a symbol. But if I were to ask you, over the, over the first 1500 years, what was the percentage of people who believed it was really Jesus? You know, surely there was a debate about it, surely there was a council saying, is that really Jesus or not? The answer is, apart from one glitch with somebody called Baron Garris, the answer is 100%. It wasn't even debated. They debated whether Jesus was God, they weren't sure about that. They debated whether the Holy Spirit was God, they weren't sure about that. They debated how Jesus could be both God and man, they weren't sure about that. They were sure about the real presence of Jesus. And they were sure about praying for the holy souls. It was a dramatic break. You and I don't really understand it, really. A dramatic break. We have this Reformation thing suddenly meaning that what has been believed for 1500 years, like the real presence of Jesus in the Holy Communion, and like praying for the holy souls, suddenly was not believed. Disastrous. 
That's why it's disastrous for somebody to lapse from their Catholic faith. We fight hard, I'm sure we in our own families of people who have lapsed and we do best and we pray for them. But maybe we should think about how hard we have to fight so that our children keep their faith, not try to react once they've actually lapsed. Because suddenly then they won't pray for holy souls. They won't pray to Mary. They won't have the privilege of when they're dying, souls coming up to them and saying, you helped me get to heaven. So now I'm going to help you to get to heaven because I'm now in heaven due to the prayers of you and so many others who prayed for the repose of my soul. It is crazy people leaving their Catholic faith and to the judgment, not just to them, although that's sad, but to so many others who depend on their prayers, those who are living, but today my emphasis on those who have died. And you and I, devout Catholics, we have to understand our responsibility to pray for the holy souls, to gain plenary indulgences for them, precisely because the other denominations do not do so. It is a privilege and a responsibility, and of course, as I've indicated already, in our favour to do so, because those souls who we do pray for, will, when they get to them, be praying for us, whether in this life, whether we ourselves indeed find ourselves in purgatory. Let me finish really with uh, um, a quote. Let me try and get it again because my phone goes off. So I have to get the password, password, and there we go. Maybe the best quote I can find about the situation of people in purgatory is, well, the St. Catherine of Genera, she gave an amazing quote. These are quotes from Wikipedia, by the way, so they're very easy to find Wikipedia. It's very good on this, on purgatory, and very informative those of you who are sort of used to using the internet. And it ends the doctrinal aspect of the, on, on this topic with a quote from Pope Benedict in his, in his encyclical, The Spes Salve. It's a bit long, but it's beautiful. Let me read it out to you. He's referring to the words in Corinthians 3, 12 to 15, about a fire that burns and saves. And he spoke of this opinion. The fire which both burns and saves is Christ himself, the judge and saviour. The encounter with him is the decisive act of judgment. Before his gaze, all falsehood melts away. The encounter with him as it burns us, transforms and frees us, allowing us to become truly ourselves. All that we build during our lives can prove to be mere straw, pure bluster, and it collapses. Yet in the pain of this encounter, when the impurity and sickness of our lives become evident to us, there lies salvation. His gaze, the touch of his heart, heals us through an undeniable painful transformation as through fire. But it is a blessed pain in which the whole power of his love sears through us like a flame, enabling us to become totally ourselves and thus totally of God. In this way, the interrelation between justice and grace also becomes clear. The way we live our lives is not immaterial, but our defilement does not stain us forever if we have at least continued to reach out towards Christ, towards truth, and towards love. Indeed, it has been burnt away through Christ's passion. At the moment of judgment, we experience and we absorb the overwhelming power of his love over all the evil in the world and in ourselves. The pain of love becomes our salvation and our joy. It is clear that we cannot calculate the duration of this transforming burning in terms of the chronological measurements of this world. The transforming moment of this encounter eludes earthly time reckoning. It is the heart's time it's time of passage to communion with God in the body of Christ. And just one more thing. Of course, Our Lady at Fatima mentions purgatory. On one occasion, Lucia asks about one person who had died. And to maybe our astonishment, we hear Our Lady saying, well, she's in purgatory to the end of the world. Well, things change. I know many priests have offered up Mass for that person, so probably that has changed. But that's a salutary reminder that purgatory is a real place and these souls need our prayers. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Ave Maria.